Thank you, everybody. So, so good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so today I'd like to discuss market data dissemination. And an exchange has a very important decision to make when it decides on what kind of model it uses to disseminate market data. It can either choose to send data about trades to everyone at the same time, or it can decide to send that data to the people that participated in the trade first and then to everyone. And generally, that's a very defining characteristic of an exchange. Different exchanges do it differently. Um, there's no, I would say, real consensus on what is the right way to do it. I think that uh, generally, less liquid securities tend to be disseminated to people that participate in the trade first. And more liquid securities, there seems to be some kind of emerging consensus that probably sending the data to everyone at the same time is a better choice. But I would like not to discuss what is the better choice. I would like to discuss the hypothetical uh, question of suppose an exchange has decided to disseminate the market data to everyone at the same time in the colo. Does that quality of being everyone on the same uh, level playing field in the colo persist after you transfer data to a different colo where you might need this data to trade? So the question I'm asking is, and I'll take the example of NASDAQ because I think NASDAQ disseminates public data first to everyone. So suppose you have the NASDAQ public data in Cartwright and you sit either at the CME or you sit at MAWA. What happens there? Is the public data still first? And to illustrate this, I will start with you know, a, a simple rendition of what a, the life of a small market data packet. So here on the screen, you can see that there are, I will be contrasting two paths. A raw data path, which essentially is what NASDAQ is doing with Apsara, and, and um, actually I should say BSO now, with BSO, uh, and transferring data from Cartwright to Mawa, say. So they have a fat pipe, and that's the thing which is, you know, the 10 wide, it's drawn to scale on the screen. And you have a market data which, a packet which arrives in gray, and it will get to a point where it needs to fit in a smaller pipe. That's the one gigabit pipe. So that's on the left. And on the right, someone's going to use the same thing, receive the same market data, but it will only want to send the red signal. So the red signal is a trade which is at the back of the packet. So as you see, you know, at some point, the packet hits the processing layer. And now I will assume that processing layer to be infinitely fast, so zero nanoseconds. And on the left side, you will want to fit the, the whole packet in the little pipe. And on the right side, you will discard everything that is before the red guy, the, the red information, and then send the red information. So as you can see, after 164 nanosecond in that case, everything has been discarded at 10 gig line rate on the right. And the uh, gray side of the packet is being serialized a little bit at one gig line rate on the left. So lo and behold, you see that on the right, with infinitely fast processing layer, you're ready to send your signal. On the left, you still have a lot of work to do. You know, you have to push that data through the small, the small pipe and you buffer up. So iterate through time. You get to the point where on the left side you're going to send the signal, the thing that will be a signal and can be received on the other side and processed on the other side. And you're essentially late by 1.2 microsecond. And that's a lot. That's a lot for you know, people that want to do tick to trade. So here, the contention is that if you're using something which is a one gig rate line to transport something you're receiving at 10 gig, 
then even though you've done your job exactly perfectly well inside the colo, public data is disseminated first. Everyone receives it at the same time. When it's, once it leaves the colo, and if you sit in MAWA, then uh, not everyone's going to get it at the same time because private data uh, or signal paths will be faster than the raw data path. The uh, ingredients of that little reasoning are obviously the ratio of the local colo pipe to the transport pipe. It's also the processing time, which I've assumed to be zero, and I'll put numbers to it. And also, it is the amount of burst that you incur at any given time. And this can only, this cannot be reasoned, it has to be simulated, so we'll be simulating this by using real data from NASDAQ. And of course, you can see that you know, th there's some kind of a fighting chance of getting this to MAWA, but if you want to get it back to the CME, for instance, and you're using 100 megabit, you know, the ratio of the two pipes is too different. It's, it's too large. You'll never get it right by sending the raw data. So let's look at uh, data uh, coming from Carteret and going to Mawa and Sakakis, and let me uh, guide you through a little bit of memory lane and, and the uh, state of uh, filing of frequencies. Today, essentially, all the services use E-band. Some um, use E-band and, and lasers, like Innova has a combined thing between E-band and laser, but everybody's using E-band. So that was 2011, and I will zoom through time very quickly. That's 2012, that's 2013, that's 2014. Oh, um, all the registration in 2014 go to that, you know, th that place between BATS and NASDAQ. Uh, I don't know if people recognize where that is. I don't know if there are any people living in New Jersey here, no? So that, you know. Who, who has a guess on, it, I can't really point, so sorry for the guys on the other side. But w what's here? Halsey? Did you say Halsey? That's the right answer. <laughs> so who, who, who got the uh, chocolate bar? Tom? All right. So chocolate bar for Tom. All right. <laughs> So, so that's Halsey, and that's because at the time that was the entry point for NYSE. Uh, and uh, you couldn't get inside of NYSE directly. But you can see in the history that from 2011, people had been looking and getting frequencies to go all the way to Mawa. So they knew at some point NYSE, or maybe they were hedging their bets, but NYSE would open something. So if I zoom through time quickly, just and I'm getting there, just uh, to you know, put nice colors on a graph, and that'll be available if you want to zoom on it. The point here is that this has been reserved, super reserved, over reserved, super PC end. Like everybody has tried to take every frequency, and it's really hard at this point to come in with another E band offer and get any kind of frequency allocation. And the paths that are, uh, no, they're, they're not ideal, they're not absolutely perfect, but they've converged and they're very good. So they're not all the same, as you can see here. Uh, and, and we've tried to map out who has what where. And you know, don't strain your eyes, we'll uh, make this available for download. But essentially the message here is that there are um, and I should have updated TMX is really ICE now. Um, SW is SW Networks. We believe they work for a particular trading firm. We don't know which one. Um, Apsara um, is BSO now and works with NASDAQ mostly. Innova works with the NYSE mostly. Totora is a prop trading firm. I think it's a published and known fact, so I think it's pretty safe to say it's trade bot. And Spread has one leg, and I think Spread is using a uh, technology which, re which requires a lot of uh, bandwidth, and it's probably hard to you know, use that and, and go to also MAWA and, uh, 
and, and go from Mawa to, uh, to NY4. I, d I don't know, can, can you comment on it, Drake? <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so anyway, the, the, the point of that slide is to say um, it's hard to produce something new now if you want to do uh, E-band. So if you want to really add to that offer, you need to go to a different frequency. And we were somehow lucky four years ago, we reserved uh, a band which is called LMDS, which was sold statewide and it was sold for other uses. Essentially, it's now gonna be used for 5G telephone. So we reserved the right to that band between the data centers. So it's unique to us. Um, we have no interference issue and we can use it fully to develop networks. So we can actually build really straight networks and now we're at the point where we're actually delivering them. And the point is that it took us four years because it was a very difficult project to build the specific radios needed for those. They weren't ex in existence in the market because LMDS was not a band that was very used at all. So now we have this. So essentially, as you can see, we either uh, are on top of the best and, and have approximately the same path length or slightly better than the best. And from what we understand, the fastest uh, between NASDAQ and MAWA today is Apsara BSO. Um, and on the two other legs, it's private firms. So it's either Totora or SW Networks. Now we have seven gigabits of bandwidth available. So the, the question posed to us is how do we use this to serve the markets? And the reason why I introduce the uh, discussion about market data dissemination is maybe we have a chance to keep the quality that the public data is first after transport if we throw all the seven gigabits to the problem. So let's look at that. Uh, so we're going to now do real simulations, meaning take all the market data for one particular day. And uh, in this case, we'll, we've chosen February 9th. February 9th was a pretty busy day. It's an interesting day. Uh, and we're plotting the raw data path. So we're saying, okay, NASDAQ has an offer, which is essentially the blue line. The graph that you see is a cumulative distribution function. So it means that on the horizontal axis, you read nanoseconds and you go to, up to a curve and read on the vertical axis, the percentage of time that the serialization of a given packet took. So if I take like 2000 nanoseconds, you can see roughly 70% of the time the NASDAQ offer serializes packets in less than 2,000 nanoseconds. And the purple one is if we were to throw the seven gigabits per second to the same issue of transporting raw data. So that you know, partially makes the obvious point that you know, more bandwidth, more uh, faster serialization, uh, but it's not really sufficient because the goal is not to be faster than uh, one gigabit per second of raw data, the goal is to see if we can be faster than um, the private paths, which have uh, only signal sending. So I need, really need to contract two paths. One on the left, which is the raw data path, and one on the right, where uh, people will be doing, either with one gig or with a shared service at one gig, the trick of sending the signals. And then now I have to introduce some latency in the equation because if you assume zero latency, you know, you're kind of you know, not doing your job completely. So let's look at that. And, and that is the first, I'm, I'm focusing now on the private path. And on the private path, you can do it two ways. You can either buy a full one gigabit line for yourself. There are very few available, but there are a few available. Uh, when I say available, I'm not sure they're available, but they're in existence and being used. Not sure there are any to sell, but there are some used. And if you do that, you have access to 
layer one transport. So you don't need to form Ethernet packets. You can send the bits that you want to send, whichever way you want to send them. So you can decide to send, say, 16 bytes to send the signals. If you buy from NASDAQ a 50 megabit tranche of bandwidth and you raise the switch and you're first to the switch, you still have to send something that is Ethernet compliant. So you will need to send something that will be 60 bytes. And of course, the same reasoning applies here. If you send more bytes on the same pipe or fewer bytes on the same pipe, the same serialization uh, occurs. So now, um, when I do compare signals, and I'll be comparing signals to raw data, I have to decide what a signal is. And of course, we don't trade, so we don't know what signals are. So for a proxy for signals, we've decided to take all the trades on the OEX100, so the largest 100 SNP stocks. And those may not all be signals, but probably most of the signals come from those. So it's, it's a reasonable proxy. So let's take this as a proxy, and we've ran uh, the comparison for the uh, private bandwidth on either a full, fully dedicated one gig line to yourself or on a shared one gig line, and that's the result of that. Now, here I'm, I'm just making the obvious point that throwing a fatter pipe on the left is going to be better for the raw data path, and I'll iterate quickly through that to show you that indeed, you know, once you've discarded the 10 gig rate on the uh, right path, you're serializing at 7 gig rate on the left path. So th the difference is very small. And as you fully serialize this, now the two signals are actually in fighting contention. You know, they're, they're fighting distance of each other. So you really need to assume numbers for the processing layer to really make sense of the difference in between the two paths. So let's do that. And, and, and of course, then again, we don't trade, so we're just making assumptions. Um, we'll be comparing two things. Someone doing alpha, which is complicated alpha. So complicated alpha, I think of it as software uh, processed alpha. And someone doing very simple alpha, and you know, in the simple alpha, all of that is a gradation. There's simple trivial, and there's this simple not that trivial, and you know, it's 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 a full uh, mixture of different alphas that you can do. But we've picked numbers which sound reasonable, um, and there are two processing numbers for the FPGA. One for the layer that receives the raw data needs to understand the raw data and think about what to do with it. That is some kind of number which we've assumed to be 700 nanosecond. And the other side is the other number. It receives a signal and it just needs to send the order. So we've assumed 350 nanosecond. You know, I'm, I'm sure people would be able to do less or maybe some people do more. I'm sure nobody's going to tell me what they do. So anyway, I can't ask. So uh, if someone's willing, maybe Steve, you, you left. Is your non-compete over? Can you say what Jum does? What? No? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Can you say what Jum does in terms of, oh, yeah, in, okay, all right, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know if those are the right numbers, but definitely uh, they're not crazy. So let's look at, with those numbers, what can we do? So now this is the mixing of everything. And on the first graph on the top, you see the zero latency assumption. And there are four lines, uh, one which is raw data over 7 gigabits. Uh, and that's the one that starts the most to the left. Uh, always at the very bottom. It's the violet one. Uh, the blue one is raw data over one gigabit per second line. And the two more steep ones are the two signal sending ones. So the interesting factor is even if you assume 
zero latency in the processing layers, the raw data of a seven gigabit wins over uh, private signals about a third of the time. And doesn't win by much, but it does win by a little bit. When you assume um, something which is uh, software, then essentially, you know, the raw data always wins at seven gigabit because I've assumed something which is uh, software on both sides. Uh, so you have a two microsecond hit on both sides. So that's a lot. That dwarfs everything else. But it means that if you're doing elaborate alpha, the quality that the public data is published to everyone at the same time essentially remains after transport in this case. So if your alpha is, is of the type that you need to do some kind of processing, it takes a bit of time, it takes memory that you need to go fetch state here and there, then uh, the raw data offering of a seven gigabits is probably gonna put you on a level playing field. Then the last graph is the graph where you're trying to do some kind of tick to trade with the latency that we indicated. And on this one, you can see for those particular numbers for that particular day of uh, Feb 9th. So I'm not claiming to have you know, truth which are uh, permanent in any shape, uh, way, or you know, in any way. Um, in that particular case, we found that the raw data over Pro, uh, over seven gigabits would beat the private pass 85% of the time. So that's interesting. Um, maybe we're in a position now with this offer on the New Jersey Triangle to essentially keep that property of the markets, which is if they decide to make the public data first, then maybe we can transport it to make it so that after transport, that property is conserved. And in order to do that, we have to decide how to sell the, uh, the seven gigabits. And you know, we, we could have decided to sell one gigabit chunks or allocate everything to the raw data. Or, and since we've simulated that and we're kind of convinced that we can change the way the market work a little bit in New Jersey, we've decided to throw everything at the raw data and try to make the um, property of NASDAQ disseminating the public data to everyone at the same time still kind of true after transport. It's not 100% true because we can't achieve 100%, but in that particular instance, it was 85%. And you know, then there are a few details which maybe will enable us to do it uh, closer to 100% of the time. That was the reasoning. Um, it's, it's not easy in our position uh, to decide what's the right thing to do. Because depending on what we do, you know, the, the, the quality of how the market operate changes a little bit. So when we come up with uh, a new technology or a new offer, we try and rack our brains as much as we can and get as much feedback as we can to see if what we're doing is the right thing to do. So that's the proposal. Um, if nobody comes after us, uh, it will be out as is um, in August. With that, uh, you know, we hope to change a little bit what you need to buy to be the fastest. So we hope to make buying one gigabit just for yourself not necessary. We hope to uh, make that available to everyone, not to only the few ones that bought the fastest network. And we hope to have something that will be compelling for you. I would like to rest my case on that <laughs> and ask for questions. Okay, everybody 
the question is, what are the legal and technological barriers that you make to make sure that um, you are the only one that has the license to transmit the 28 gig, but everyone has license to receive. I can just talk about it. What are the technological and legal barriers that you put in order to make sure that nobody just open an antenna and get your packets? Uh, so so that, that's an interesting question, um, and I'm, I'm not sure I really understand the legal framework, so I, my uh, responses are not very good. But anyway, uh, I'll try to give them to you. So technologically, it took us a long time to develop the radios. The radios are a little strange, um, so it would take some development and, and you know, Anybody can do anything. Like there are smart people everywhere. So it would take a little bit of time before someone else could do that. And I think we would be able to see it because the ra the, the antennas themselves would be slightly different. And to compete with this, you would need to be on the roof of the data center. So it's hard to to hide. What about encryption? Well, adding encryption adds latency, and and the issue is. I think there's a theorem, which is not a theorem because it's not proved, uh, but it's still a theorem because it holds, is that we can never, ever do anything that will slow anything. Otherwise, someone else is going to be faster. <laughs> so if we do encrypt, uh, I don't know, maybe people can do it in less than 100 nanoseconds, but still 100 nanoseconds is going to count. But uh, yeah, it, it'd be fun to look at the... Uh, uh, the data centers and looking at who's trying to eavesdrop. Another question? One more over here. Sure, my name's Jeremy Greiner. Stefan, you said it took four years to develop the radios. Uh, how much more optimization do you think there would be in the radio itself and uh, how fast is it performing? Uh, how fast? Uh, I think we'll discuss it uh, under NDA. It's a little bit like, you know, I, I heard you. I'm not like Steve. I heard you. <laughs> but I'll come tell you uh, in private. Now, how much more optimization there is? At some point, you, you got to think that all the layers, like, you know, the radio layers, the switch layers, the processing layers, everything's going to sit on the same FPGA at some point. So we, we're not there yet. So we have more to do. And I don't know how long it's going to take. Because you know, being able to have you know, communication between the dif different layers, which are in the standard protocol, is pretty useful in terms of not uh, having too much te technological risk. You can replace one bit and, and you know, be okay with, with something that you did otherwise well. Uh, one day, everything's going to sit on the same FPGA. Okay, um, I'll do one more. All right, last, last question. We could have a question back. Just curious, the technology itself, where else do you see that being deployed in the US? Long hauls, can it go anywhere else? So, um, probably not long haul because uh, what we uh, acquired was just the rights to link the data centers, but we didn't acquire the rights statewide. The rights statewide is, have just been auctioned, I think, uh, for Ohio and, and the place where you would think, you know, no offense meant at all, but where it would cost less. And the cost of the statewide license in Ohio is, I don't remember, but north of 100 million. Um, so it's like you can't buy it now. It's frequencies that are used for 5G networks. It's infinitely more valuable than finance. Like as, as much as we think we're really valuable, like, you know, talking on the phone to your friends is, is more valuable. Okay, I think, uh, I think we're about out of time. Uh, I just want to thank you, Stefan, for your great presentation. Thanks very much.